without further ado, please help me welcome to the stage Mr. Jay Craig from Meritor. Thanks a lot, how are you? Thank you. Morning, everyone. Great to be here, and I uh, took a quick uh, preview of the floor and just phenomenal uh, amount of technology down there. And that will really lead into what I want to talk to you about today. As CEO of an industrial company that's been around over 100 years, um, you could walk through that floor and be quite frightened. I mean, we have a lot of capital invested in more traditional technologies. And so this talk I want to give you today is how we're adapting to that approach and how we're taking a new approach to move and to embrace these new technologies. And I encourage you to come to our booth and really see all the partnerships we've formed and how aggressively we're moving to meet those clean air objectives that Dr. Liu just spoke about. Uh, rather than push them off and be afraid of them, we've decided to embrace it and move aggressively into the market. So, so like, uh, there are many other industries besides ours that have dealt with a significant amount of change. And I would tell you, I hope I never see Meritor's name on this chart as it's displayed through here. Uh, some companies have had, obviously, great difficulty in adapting to that change. And they've all struggled for years or just ceased to exist. And so as you look at companies like ours that have been around for about a century, that list becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. And there are some companies that have been successful in adapting to the change. And so what can we do to make sure that we are one of the su successful companies in the future? OK, be honest. How many of you wish this could be the case? So you look at this comic and say, I have to say there are some mor Monday mornings I arrive at the office and I wish this could all be true as we look at all the change that impact us. It, it's uh, probably not a good strategy or a good approach if you want to be successful in the future. And I think we would all accept that. We're certainly at one of the most dynamic forks in the road our industry has ever seen. Uh, the push for electrification and alternative fuels, in my opinion, is the most significant change we're seeing in our lifetime impacting the commercial vehicle industry and is requiring some of the greatest investment we'll ever see in the history of the industry. And it's a very, very difficult time to foresee the future and predict what the outcomes would be. Just consider some of the variables on electric vehicles, the price of batteries, when will that break point come where the paybacks look like the CNG graph that Dr. Liu showed just a moment ago, the size of the batteries and the impact that has on payload, the legislative changes and impact as legislatures try to work with industry and determine the best approach forward. And then obviously one of the biggest challenges is just infrastructure. Where will all the power, to power source come from that will fuel these vehicles in the future? So it's a really a question for all of our organizations. Do we stay the course? Do we go headlong into the future? Or do we do some, some approach that's really a combination of both? Because the truth is, as we look forward, and I talked to my board as I did last week in our, in our meetings, the future 10 years from now could look very much the same, or it could look dramatically different. And it's not always clear. The pace of change that we're seeing right now, we're having to deal with, is just getting more and more rapid. And it makes it very difficult to have planning decisions. I have to tell you, when I stood up here on the stage and ran through these slides, I, I was kind of the architect of that slide. I wanted people to feel uncomfortable with the pace of change. Uh, being five feet off the ground and looking at that slide, it makes you a little dizzy. I think I'm the most uncomfortable person here at this point in time. But, uh, but just dealing with that pace of change is a big challenge for all of us. This is one of my favorite quotes from Jack Welch, the retired CEO of GE. If the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. And so I try to think of that and keep our team pushing forward to constantly be looking externally and make sure we're keeping up with that rate of change as we go forward. And as an example, 
we have quarterly two-day strategy meetings of our executive team. We just had that last week. And so we start those off on the first day for the first two hours. We begin to bring in a group of economists and analysts to walk us through for two hours what has changed in the last quarter around the globe in all the markets we serve in terms of different legislation, in terms of what our competitors are doing, in terms of the markets, the economic changes for the quarter. And what that get does for us is for those next two days, make sure we have that external impact looking into the organization as we look to make decisions about our strategies going forward. Another favorite quote of mine is, uh, is from Bill Gates, who said, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. So as you look at these forecasts, I think you can see what Mr. Gates made, it, it, what the point he was trying to make, is as we look in the next couple years, what is so difficult for companies like us is that return on investment does not exist because the rate of change will may be quite slow over the next couple years. But as we look to the next decade, the impact could be quite significant, and we have to make certain we're still relevant at that time. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is forecasts like these, when you're in markets that are changing rapidly, tend, become, tend to become obsolete overnight. And we could all think about a forecast we had for different markets, be it electrification in our industry, or even the stock market that for me is a little depressing right now as it's moving down. If we looked back a year from now, we would have had a completely different forecast. And so we have to keep that in mind. Now here's a forecast of some other applications. As I walked the floor this morning, there are certainly a number of vehicles addressing these applications, whether it's school bus, drayage, terminal tractor, rescues vehicles, transit vehicles. And these forecasts, you can see the expected rate of adoption is expected to be much more aggressive. And we at Meritor believe that wholeheartedly, and you'll see our applications in our booth trying to address that pace of change. And if some of you don't believe it, go to China like I do and many of our team do. 60% of the new transit buses being produced in day, today in China are fully electric. So if you don't believe these forecasts, it will come, from a, come to us from the other side of the globe if we don't embrace it. So you can believe it if you will, or I would say deny it at your own risk. So you'd say, okay, great. I've heard these statistics before. I've heard all this data before, but what do I do about it? So what I want to walk you through is a process that we're, we go through at Meritor whenever we see significant changes in the playing field in which we're operating in. We look at resource allocation. We look at our product portfolio, both current and future product plans. We look at our core competencies to make certain those are still relevant for the future and how we can apply those. We look at our partnerships we have today and see how we should supplement and add to those to address the future opportunities that are coming because of the change in the marketplace. And then we look very, very closely at our integration with our customer because in times of rapid change, you can easily become out of step with your customers and that is the quickest way to relevancy. So let me just walk you through these. So resource allocation. Uh, capital allocation, as has been written over and over, is the means to how to make certain your strategies get executed. If anybody talks to you about a strategy and doesn't have a commitment of capital or funds, it's just a dream until you get that commitment. So it's probably the most important decision you have to make as you look forward into the future. A recent Forbes story said business leaders are hesitant to invest in new business models even though they see the significant technological changes coming. And being a CEO of a large company, I can see how that happens. We are the market leader around the globe, in every major region of the globe, in drive axles and braking. 
And as you can imagine, that takes an enormous amount of capital and investment to retain that market leadership position. And our shareholders, we have our quarterly re release on Thursday, are expecting we'll retain that every quarter, every year. But also, we have to keep in mind, we could be irrelevant a decade from now if we don't invest in advanced technology. And capital is, is a limited resource. It's a finite resource. And so how do we allocate that? So one of the decisions I made is I have the electrification team report directly to me. And it's certainly not because I am the most capable person to run that activity. I will acknowledge that, be the first person to acknowledge it. But it is because I want to make sure it's getting the capital and the people resources allocated and dedicated to it that are required, and it doesn't get overrun by the day-to-day -day needs of our business. And so that's how we address that. We also look at different time and talent that we have to allocate. I've asked each member of our executive team to study different verticals, so individually, They've each taken on, whether it's refuse, school bus market, heavy truck markets, and other markets, determine what the expected impact of electrification will be on those markets, and then report back to us as a team how we, Meritor, will, will interact and be successful in, in engaging and delivering electric applications to those individual markets. And so that gets our whole team involved in allocating resources and committed to the future as well. Now, the last point I'd leave with you on this chart is there's a natural tendency in any organization just towards inertia. And what I mean by that, we've all come across people, they determine that any energy in action is good, no matter where it's going, and they will move and keep moving. And our approach is to make sure that inertia is directed in the proper way. And so we looked at more an options approach. And what I mean by that is we're trying to retain optionality for as long as we can in the future until the situation becomes more clear so that we can make certain we're successful. And I know that's a really academic concept. So I want to walk you through just an example, and I'll use product portfolio as a way to do that. So as I mentioned, we are the market leader in drive axles across the globe. What's pictured here is our 14X rear drive axle. This is the most widely applicated rear axle in North America and some other markets in the world. And so we're taking an approach with this product that we would call evolutionary. And so we've taken the product, optimized bi-directional gearing, bearings, downsized brakes, all to take advantage of the regenerative uh, braking capabilities of electric drivetrains. We've also reduced significantly, reduced the noise of gearing. As the internal combustion engine re is removed, obviously one of the issues we've seen, all the other ambient noise from the vehicles rises in terms of sensitivity. So we've taken this product and significantly reduced the gear noise. And I would call that an evolutionary approach. But we've also invested in another option, which we have on display downstairs, which is our e-axle, which is a fully integrated motor two-speed shifter into the axle. We believe it's one of the most lightest weight applications of this technology, very compact. And this allows much more battery cap capacity to be installed on the vehicle and we think is one of the most efficient applications of this type of technology. And that, I think, is a good example of just retaining two options for the future until we get more certainty of what it looks like and make certain that Meritor is still relevant into the next decade. Now, we're also announcing today that we are launching our Blue Horizon brand, and this is just a summation of all this technology driven towards optimizing electric vehicles. And again, you'll see that on the display downstairs. And we've really gotten to this point to be able to do, do such a launch of the brand because all of the investment we've put in the products over the last couple of years. 
And so we, we are celebrating the launch of the brand and making sure Meritor is viewed as one of the leaders in electric applications in the future. So I think the third area that you need to focus on in times change is your core competencies that I spoke to in the beginning. Now we being a 100 year old industrial, we have a lot of core competencies that we've built over the years. And those include brand equity. Our brand equity stands for the highest quality, most dependable drive axles and brakes in the world. That's what we are constantly told. And that has a lot of power in a bringing in new applications under that brand umbrella. And then we have established customer relationships around the globe. I personally can pick up the phone and call the CEO of every major truck manufacturer in the globe. And our executive team can do that throughout the ranks of the different, different vehicle manufacturers. So there is a lot of uh, core just power in that relationship with the customer base. And then we have a deep understanding of product applications and requirements. Uh, we have been through the war of shattering axles, breaking brakes in all different applications. And we can bring that knowledge on what's required in the market. And then we have a large service and support system throughout the globe and field service. So we look at those competencies and we say, what additional partnerships and collaborations do we need to enter that can supplement what our competencies are with the skills that new entrants to the markets are bringing. And so, for example, we've entered partnerships with UQM, the motor manufacturer. We have no expertise in electric motors. Uh, so we engaged with UQM to partner with us on the E-axle I showed earlier. And then we made an investment and formed a partnership with TransPower to bring a more fully integrated solution to electrified vehicle requirements. And so these companies, as you can see, bring specific expertise and really leverage around our core competencies. And I think a great example of what this drives in terms of benefit to Meritor and our partners is in the announcement we're making today that we've been selected by Peterbilt for, to deliver all electric programs for two of their vehicles. One being a class eight day cab tractor. Uh, we'll be delivering 12 of those. And then three fully electric uh, refuse vehicles as well. And so through this partnership with TransPower, we'll be providing the high efficiency and lightweight axles and brakes and drive lines that we spoke to earlier. And TransPower will be coordinating with us and to bringing the electric drivetrain and controls and batteries and battery management. And Peterbilt feels they get the best of both worlds. They get our broad service and support network. They get the high tech capabilities of TransPower. And so I think the power of that partnership, we keep seeing over and over again on opportunities like this. So really the last uh, area of focus I would ask you to consider is customer integration. And in my opinion, it's really the most important one. As I mentioned, in times of rapid change, you can quickly become out of sync with what your customer strategy is. So we try to stay very closely aligned, not only with their executive teams, but more importantly, their future product program teams, and move with them step by step. And I think the picture on this chart is a good example of a company that didn't stay in step with its customers, BlackBerry, uh, arguably had the dominant market share in mobile data communication devices and quickly lost it to companies like Apple because they came disconnected from what customer expectations were and were, in my opinion, too internally focused. So we try to make certain that we're constantly out in front of our customers testing our strategies and our theories of where the market is headed and trying to align them with them. And this has led us to a pretty big decision early on in this game at Meritor. We will be an open architecture for electrification. And what I mean by that is we will provide to our customers whatever they need. Some of our customers want to do their own electric vehicle and battery management, and we'll provide the components they need from us. 
Some like Peterbilt on the previous slide want a full turnkey solution, we'll provide that. And this has been very well received by our customer base because they don't view us as a threat. They view us as a true partner, only trying to make them successful. And so that was one of our large strategic decisions that came out from listening very, very closely to our customers in the marketplace. And so I'm gonna leave you with this last slide. And I know for people who don't have gray hair like me, you won't even know who this person is. Uh, this was one of my idols growing up when I was a teenager. Uh, this is from a, a show called Happy Days, which was the most popular show in 1970s television. One of the main characters is pictured here. This is the Fonz. And the Fonz always looked like this, no matter what the circumstance. His hair was perfect. He had on this leather jacket, no matter how ridiculous it may appear when you're on water skis. The Fonz always had that. But this particular episode coined a phrase called, don't jump the shark. And this was an episode where the Fonz was dared into jumping over a pool of sharks on water skis, uh, having never really water skied before in his life. Um, and it was felt by the TV critics, this is probably when they went to a bridge too far in the show and it was starting to decline as they looked in hindsight. And so now it's a defined term. So if you read the definition in the Urban Dictionary, it's when something's reached its peak and begun a downhill slide towards mediocrity and oblivion. And so that's what the term don't jump the shark is. So what I'd leave you with today is, as you look at your organizations, hopefully you take some of these lessons that I talked about today and you will not jump the shark with your companies as I'm planning not to with ours. So thank you very much for your time and have a great show. Thank you.